In the next 30 minutes, we will take a look at the men who are breaking down the walls of art. Walls between painting and sculpture, between the plastic and the time arts, and most especially, the walls between us and the work of art. These are some of the artists and their art. The art of the 1960s. George Siegel's real world recalls the landscape of his Bronx childhood. Real objects, not just coming off the wall, but in use by life-size plaster figures, caught doing the most banal of things. The artists of the early 60s inviting us to enjoy the sights and sounds of roadside America, the products of its popular culture. Klaus Oldenburg once opened a store on the Lower East Side to sell items like these cigarette butts, or Kapok-filled hamburgers, painted canvas trousers, giant slices of plaster pie, among his customers have been several of the world's leading museums. But Oldenburg has gone on to bigger things. An 850-foot drain pipe for Toronto's Coronation Park. Oldenburg chooses his monuments carefully for each city. For New York, he proposes giant teddy bears for the north end of Central Park. A fudgesicle to cover the Pan Am building. A hot dog, big as an ocean liner for Ellis Island. An ironing board straddling the Lower East Side. A giant electric fan to replace the Statue of Liberty. There's some people I know who don't see anything funny in my work, and other people see that the work is very funny and think that that's the most uh, important and civilized thing about it. I, I admire, I don't want to put down uh, humor because I admire it and I think that that's one of the things that's going to save us, but uh, it certainly isn't intended to be uh, humorous. It's intended, to, and it's not even intended to be art in a way, it's just intended to be important. Pollock was a dominant force even before his sudden death made him a hero. Expressing himself by the yard. Exploring pure paint with an epic private vision. Total physical immersion in the painting process itself. Revealing the most intimate details of the painter's subconscious. Pollock embodied the vigor and set the pace for the New York School. His colleague, Willem de Kooning, making every stroke, every color as personal as a signature. Franz Klein, 
broad brush strokes, impatient to thrust off the canvas. Robert Motherwell, voluptuous personal metaphors. Adolf Gottlieb, poised between the turbulence of Pollock and the serenity of Rothko and Newman. The abstract expressionists had fathered a school of painting. They had developed an American tradition to admire. Barnett Newman recalls the problems this raised for the generation to come. They were confronted with a, uh, with a new problem, the problem being uh, the tradition that had been developed by men of my generation. And uh, they had to confront that. The problem with uh, uh, admiring painters like, like de Kooning and Klein and uh, Pollock and Newman is that you've really, uh, in order to begin to work, you've got to uh, forget about what they did. Because it, it has to be new for you to do anything. The only forms you can understand are the forms that you invent. And it's your color, your kinds of shapes, your material, and so forth. Judd's contemporaries and the objects familiar to their time the colors of the new chemistry, forms of the new map, geometry of the space age. They broke the rectangle of the traditional canvas. Judd's own work breaks away from its flat surface. Three-dimensional painted objects, precise repetitions, echoes of technology, even made by machine. Making something is a matter of labor. And I think labor on the whole is fairly dull activity. So I don't mind missing all that construction that took such a long time. It certainly doesn't lessen my connection with the work. Specialists in execution freeing the painter to be a specialist in conception. The heirs of the New York school more interested in the problem than in the physical pleasures of solving. Convinced that painting had run its course, some painters, like Saul LeWitt, make objects of mathematical ideas. This piece will use two constant lengths to build sets of three-dimensional permutations. I like the general looks of a piece. Yeah. I'd like you to get this thing... Uh, Why well, have to polished. be satin it, right. Be satin. But don't get it too shiny. No, I mean it. I know, I know. It's, uh, it's too shiny, but not too shiny. Well, I don't. I want. I don't want it to reflect anything. No, no. You want it dead. I want it so that it's visible, but I don't want to see anybody else in it. Well, you a know, leading painter in the older generation, Barnett that's Newman, that's was to become an important I mean, figure in the new. It should be better. It's, what right. about the base? Can we look at it? All right. Newman was among this factory's first customers. The firm of Tridel and Gratz once made only metal furniture. Now they work with more than a half dozen painters. The only reason, no, the only reason you're bolting is because you can't weld it. Why well, can't weld it? Well, that's true. Aluminum and steel just doesn't. But it would be much better if it were actually steel because then it becomes a part of the piece. Yes, it does. All right. All right. I would All right. prefer steel, because then nobody can take that face away from it. <laughs> In the beginning, it wasn't their sincerity I doubted. I just didn't like this idea of my making their sculpture. But uh, I've gotten reconciled to this. That was really my only personal problem. I shouldn't say problem, but something I had to overcome to, to feel right about doing it. I had quite a discussion with the fabricator about that because my things are stamped by Gratz, executed by, and I sort of objected to the word. I thought it should have been made by, and uh, he was right. Donald was right because he said, no, that he did not make it. He only executed what I wanted him to make. And I thought, I realized that that was proper. The collaboration between art and technology established. And the technologist established as a partner of artists, like Ronald Bladen. Bladen's rhomboids being set up in the upper garden of the Museum of Modern Art. Geometry become monumental. 
Art too big to be a private experience. Once again, art was becoming public, for a public to see, to become involved with, to react to. An early friend of Pollock and Newman, and an architect for 20 years, Tony Smith finds a virtue in improvising materials. I find that even in the case of pieces which are covered with the car undercoating, that after a while the undercoating takes on a matte quality, which makes it difficult to determine just exactly what the material of the whole happens to be. And I find this des very desirable because, you know, uh, least of all do I want it to look like plywood covered with car undercoating. I like a certain amount of mystery involved, which demands involvement on the part of the person seeing it. I think that the size of a work has something to do with the kinetic quality. It demands a certain amount of action, and uh, I don't know why I find this uh, desirable, but I seem to. I would say that when I begin something, I don't know what it's going to uh, be like. When something is more or less finished, my first response to it has to be whether I accept it or reject it, not whether I can improve it or anything of that kind. This is really sculpture? It's supposed to be sculpture? Well, uh, they are masses uh, located in space. They have to be sculptural. The work was done at a time when I never thought of it in connection with the art world, whatever. I thought of it in relation to my backyard. I thought of it in relation to certain loneliness or something like that in my own life. And uh, I saw a void out there among the leaves and uh, got a certain amount of kick out of filling it. or entertainment. Jackie Casson used to make moving sculpture of farm equipment in plaster and metal. Soon she became interested in the movement alone, abandoned all materials, and now works only with light and shadow. Her partner is painter and filmmaker Rudy Stern. Light, art's oldest concern not duplicated, or even played on the object, but light as the thing itself, the popular culture of the discotheque as an art form. This is a deep water job called jump fish, and it's going to jump. Fifteen foot long. It's going to get right out of the surface of the lake and go like this. Art that refuses to stand still, like Len Lai at 66. For 50 years, a mystic tinker, fascinated by motion, sounding the walls between art and energy. He envisions this piece 150 feet tall. Its name, Fountain.
Glenn Lai has been internationally acclaimed for films like Free Radicals. He invented the painstaking technique of direct drawing on film, which he uses to make rhythmic abstractions. In my work, I try to get a, some essential business going on. I call it, in my instance, a kind of a jizzy quality, and I just say that my work has a kind of jizz. You grip the needle and you put it into the celluloid and you scratch a design. Now that design has to be repeated 24 times to give you a second of animation, a second of picture. So you do 24 in succession and it is, once you get into the knack of it, it's as simple as writing your signature 24 times. Bell one. This is the thing that sways in the breeze. It's a rod. On it are two bells, two East Indian bells. Now here we have flip. Quite a different uh, idea. Quite a different motion. Quite a different principle to this one. This is a band of metal which is turning and flipping. Uh, hence flip. Flip will be in a temple. It'll be 60 foot long, and its tremulous quality will involve you. Feel the tension of the thing gradually turning inside out and going wham, like the triggering that occurs sometimes when you get sudden feelings. Follow? Now, Storm King is going to hang on the outside of a barn in the country and be programmed for evening entertainment or at any time you want to get a hypnotic effect of great energy, the sound of a storm. That's why it's called Storm King. Now, here is some of the sound it makes. One is blade, B-L-A-D-E, a blade of steel. It will be about anything from 50 feet to 100 foot high. It will rotate and reflect light to you. And you'll hear the striker booming up. It's like an Aztec monument to the sun.
my work, I think, is going to be uh, pretty good for the 21st century. Why the 21st? is simply that there won't be the means until then, I don't think there'll be the means to have what I want, which is enlarged versions of my work and uh, big-scale jobs which uh, will have to be housed in their own temples. West Levine's The Star Garden at the Museum of Modern Art. Four room-sized squares of shaped plexiglass. They're convex walls designed to break down the wall between you and the work, between you and your environment. It also <clears throat> uh, has the effect of bringing to you the information which is immediately surrounding the area, in that if you look at, through, at it as you pass through it, you, you uh, see the buildings that are surround here and so what you get is the sensation of your own physicality plus the information around you and you get a, a funny sensation because for the first time in your, you you see yourself moving in the environment in which you really move Marta Manujan once named woman of the year in her native Argentina now in New York on a foundation grant her colleague research engineer Per Bjorn Their project, menu phone, programmed to let you dial your own environment. Closed circuit television and eight other effects bombarding your senses with information about yourself. Hello, I must call you. I call from the telephone booth. Yes, it's the first time that we try. Yes, but second, but we must try many times until it starts to work. Oh, now the, the water is coming out, the water. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yes. Yes. You see the sign? The, the sign? The noise? Or the what? <laughs> it's green, green, green. It's beautiful. And you see differently. All the colors different. Marta Mnugin complains that the technology is outdated before she starts. The effects, water rising, wind blowing, delayed tape, she regards as only models of what she would like. Walls that let you see yourself with famous people via satellite television. Teletype printouts of what you have to say. Movements of the booth that make your hair stand on end. Jets of air to blow you out of the booth entirely. A 21st century media mix of information about yourself. Monster Charlie, what you see there? You want to explain it to you, George? This must cost about a uh, $10,000. It's mylar. And then it's just destroyed. Three rooms completely covered in silver mylar. Les Levine's slipcover at the Architectural League. Projected lights, slides, and giant pillows inflating. You as the work of art. It's the coldest, weirdest thing I've ever seen, but. It's very warm at the same time. It's the, it's kind of a cold, it's a warm coldness. It, I get a feeling that this, these um, structures are breathing. They're inhaling and they're exhaling. Uh, I also think of elephants for some reason. I think it's because it's so crinkly and because it's so huge. I never realized I liked elephants so much. I mean, you can't get away from the fact that when people see themselves in these uh, reflections and they they see themselves changing from blue to red I mean it turns them on they just look so beautiful Wes Levine calls his material for these experiences disposable art since you can't wall up experience he says enjoy it and once you've had it throw it away I'm sort of like terribly concerned with getting rid of retentive elements in art, keeping an experience around because it was a good experience. You know, it's very nice to have good experiences, but it's very bad to want to have the same good experience forever.
Robert Rauschenberg's studio. May 1967. Rauschenberg's works will demand a new name for their form. He will call them revolvers. I tend to make uh, what I would like to see. And uh, I think that's probably the, the best excuse. Uh, I think I probably wouldn't even uh, uh, make things if uh, other people were uh, busy making things that I would like to see. The chassis has just been delivered from the fabricator. This is the first time Rauschenberg and his assistant have seen the five discs revolving. A famous critic once said that art is what the artists are doing. These are some of the things our artists are up to. Breaking down the walls between art and the spectator. Art and science. Perhaps art and life itself. What do they mean? Well, even that question can be a wall between us and the works of art. If you try to understand art, you're lost. These artists are saying, don't think about it. Look. Feel. Let it sink in. Then come back and look again. Will art ever go back on the wall where once we thought it belonged? I don't know, but I, for one, will be keeping my eyes open, and I hope my mind open, too. For of all the walls to come tumbling down, the most rewarding for anyone is the wall between himself and the experience of his times. 